Thank you, Tiana, and good morning, everyone. Uh, actually, I'm going to go through uh, some old things today. You know, I'm, I've been working with mildew for a long time, so I'm going to uh, go over the highlights of our fungicide resistance survey. We actually um, completed it uh, last winter or last spring. And then I'm going to speak about some other foliar uh, diseases or leaf spots, uh, one of which used to be more problematic than it is now, and one of which uh, we've has been reported in the area, but I have never, uh, I have yet to see it, and I've been here 37 years. But I'm going to cover them both, uh, given uh, given how much is uh, changing, particular particularly with our climate. There we go. The fungicide uh, resistance survey was funded by the Research Commission, uh, the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission, Oregon Sweet Cherry, uh, the Northwest Nursery Improvement Institute, and the Commission on Pesticide Registration. And we did this survey starting back in 2018 and uh, continued all the way into uh, early 22. The vast majority of our isolates were collected during the summer of 2021, and we uh, collected isolates from 100 different or over 100 different orchard sites in Washington and Oregon. And we uh, tried to get five sub samples with, within each of those orchards. So we had 400 or 500 different samples to run. And uh, last year at this time, when I spoke at this meeting, we had only gotten through about 100 of those. So we have since finished those. Real high-tech collection system is just walking through the orchard, uh, picking out some infected leaves, putting them in a bag, throwing them into a cooler, take them back to the lab, uh, extract the DNA from the isolates, and then we ran PCR looking for three, uh, three different fungicide mutations, and I won't read uh, through, through these here, but one uh, mutation indica indicates resistance to group 11 fungicides, the other group three and the other group seven. So we were able with these molecular tests to get through these uh, samples much more rapidly than we would have been able to do with a bioassay, but it still took over a year. Sorry about that. These are the three different uh, molecular tools we used uh, to try to detect resistance in the various isolates. Now, a number of things I want to go over, I'm not going to go over in excruciating detail, but there are certain concepts that we found uh, during the course of the study or certain things caught our attention. And as I get to the end of the summary, we even have more questions uh, that we will, uh, somebody will need to answer in the future about uh, fungicide resistance. But one interesting thing we found was at Howard Flat. And as you know, Howard Flat or Howard Flats is somewhat isolated, not as isolated as it used to be. But what we did some sampling in the Howard Flat area. And this table here, the orchard is on the left. We sampled eight different orchards. And there are three columns there, group three, group seven, and group 11. If there's a plus, it means that the isolate was resistant to that group. So if you look at, at the results from Howard Flat, we found resistance to the group 11s in four of the eight orchards. We found resistance to group three in one of those eight, but look at orchard number five, there's resistance to both uh, fungicide groups. So that was something uh, we should have known uh, we'd encounter, but we, we certainly did not ex expect it. And another thing we found, this was in an orchard in uh, Richland, uh, those of you that are familiar with Richland, uh, Keene Road uh, essentially goes from uh, West Richland to Richland. And as you get in uh, closer to the, or more towards Kennewick, uh, there's Bethel Church and the orchard is, is right near Bethel Church and the Yoke Supermarket is over here. But we did uh, sample this spatially and at each different, uh, we did a transect, and at each different spot here, we collected five isolates. And interestingly, what we found here is if you look at the position along the transect, one, two, three, four, five, we only found resistance at one of those 
spots in the orchard. So this tells us that there's spatial variability. You might have one part of the orchard um, where the predominant strain is resistant to group 11 or group, uh, group three, whereas another part of an uh, orchard, you do not see the same thing. So this really complicates it. If someone were to ask me, do I have resistance to this in my orchard? And I went out and took a sample. I could tell them, yes, at this spot in your orchard, but we don't know about the rest of it. And I won't go into the, the results here, but we also studied, uh, we looked for resistance in, in cherry nurseries in the Columbia Basin. And sometimes, uh, for example, in a cherry uh, nursery, when we would collect the isolates early in the season, that is when we first start seeing the mildew, we would find resistance to group 11 or group three. And then when we came back in late August and resampled or subsampled, sometimes we didn't find it on the second sampling. So we all also think this can be variable uh, in time. So the bottom line, uh, roughly 50% of the orchards that we sampled had resistance to group uh, three and or group 11. As a, again, as I said, in some uh, locations, we did find orchard locations, we found resistance to both three and 11. That was about 8% of the total orchards that we sampled. So the double resistance isn't nearly as common as individual resistance. And uh, as far as the future goes, we found very, very little resistance uh, to group seven. So, and this was all right down around the Ringgold, uh, Eltopia area, uh, just several orchards. So over a hundred different orchards sampled. Uh, again, roughly 50% of the orchard sites, we found resistance to three and or 11. Uh, resistance, I would say, is prevalent, but it's variable in both groups. And what I mean by variable, for example, it was very common for us to find group 11 uh, resistance regardless of the geographic location. But one notable exception was Stemilt Hill. We found no resistance to group 11 on uh, Stemilt Hill, none to group 7, but we did find uh, some to group 3. So uh, but there, there are no real discernible geographic uh, patterns. The resistance to both 3 and 11 is, I would say, widespread and, and geographically spread out. Uh, spatial patterns, I mentioned those. Again, the, the orchards where uh, the orchard where we went along a transect, we found that the uh, resistance varied spatially. And again, we have some evidence uh, that they, they can also vary in time. And these are two areas where some future research could be really useful. The other thing, and I didn't put the point on here be, because I ran out of room, another thing that needs to be studied vis-a-vis -vis this resistance is whether or not the resistant isolates are fit, uh, meaning that do the resistance ice, resistant isolates actually survive the winter. In some cases of fungicide resistance in other crops, they have found that the resistant isolates they can be damaging during the season, but they're not fit and they don't survive. So these are three things that require further study and uh, hopefully someone uh, can tackle this. Now onto the uh, leaf spots and how this came up was uh, some questions that we had regarding the uh, crop protection guide. And two of those diseases, uh, what I would call leaf spots on cherry are one is called shot hole, and the old timers uh, in here, which uh, very much includes myself, uh, have probably seen this before. I used to see it quite often back in the 80s and early 90s. And the other leaf spot uh, that I'm going to address here is what is called cherry leaf spot. I was uh, trained back in Ohio where it obviously rains more and it's cooler and it's more humid. Uh, cherry leaf spot uh, is the predominant foliar cherry disease in areas like that. I have never seen cherry leaf spot in my 37 years uh, in Eastern Washington, but it has been reported once from one of the diagnostic clinics. So it, it may be here. So I'll, I'll dig into these a little bit more. Again, we're talking about uh, a plant disease here. And in order to have a plant disease, you have to have the interaction of three things, the susceptible host, 
a pathogen that's present in a conducive environment. And this is called the plant disease triangle. And what I'm going to zero in on here vis-a-vis -vis these two diseases are the environment. Now, when I used to see shot hole, well, before I get to that, these both of these pathogen or cool, pathogens are cool, wet weather diseases. We probably aren't going to see them in the middle of the summer. It gets just gets too hot uh, in this area, particularly as you get uh, further south. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about ele getting electric vehicles. Is your next vehicle going to be electric? And I live down around Richland, and it, the summers there it may get scaldingly hot. And if I were to go out and buy a new, a second vehicle, it would not be a Tesla. I would buy a Camel. It, it gets that hot. So it's uh, definitely not uh, disease conducive temperatures. So of those environmental factors, uh, some of them are moisture in the form of rain, dew, relative humidity, temperature, and then some of the others are light air movement and pH. The two I'm going to focus on are moisture and temperature. Both of these pathogens, and I'll get into more depth about each pathogen here, but they're both highly dependent on it, on free water. That is a film of water on the foliage, fruit, or twigs in order to be able to uh, penetrate the plant. So man in the orchard environment. Again, it gets so hot here in the summer, uh, our temperatures would not be uh, conducive to either shot hole or cherry leaf spot. But earlier in the year when we're using, uh, for example, if we were using uh, sprinkler irrigation for uh, frost, frost protection, that could provide the wetting that these pathogens need. And if the temperatures are cool, uh, some of our evaporative cooling setups uh, could actually promote it. But when I used to see shot hole almost uh, yearly was back in the old days when we still had a lot of cherry orchards, particularly down in the Yakima Valley under over the canopy irrigation. I used to see uh, shot hole during years when we uh, really had to grapple with frost. And what we were doing, the over the canopy irrigation was providing the pathogen with the moisture it needs to A, get dispersed to the uh, susceptible host tissue, and it provides the wetting requirement uh, necessary for penetration. So uh, in the case of irrigation, and whether it be over the canopy or under the canopy, if it's hitting uh, the host tissue, it can be serving as a dispersal agent and it provides the wetting of the host that both of these fungi need uh, to penetrate the host. Not gonna go into any depth uh, here about a third disease. Uh, you've probably, particularly those of you who have been around a while, probably have heard of Cytospora canker or Leucostoma canker. Uh, we found uh, that under the canopy sprinklers, in an orchard that had cankers of leucostoma, uh, the irrigation was the primary means of the pathogen moving from tree to tree. So uh, our irrigation plays a large role um, in our diseases. So shot hole in a, a bit more depth, we used to call it cranium blight. Uh, the fungus that causes this is uh, Wilsonomyces carpophilus. Uh, cranium blight used to be the old name for it, and it started to uh, be known, become known as shot hole in the uh, mid 80s. It's a major disease problem on almonds in California, and it affects many species of prunus. And it's called shot hole because if the leaves get infected, you'll see a lesion. And the lesions are very difficult to distinguish from lesions caused uh, lesions of cherry leaf spot. Uh, but the center of both legions, that is the dead tissue in the middle of the legion frequently falls out, leaving the leaf looking like a shot hole. The only difference I can really tell between the lesions of shot hole and cherry leaf spot is that the cherry leaf spot lesions tend to be more uniform in size, whereas the shot hole will be generally a bit larger and uh, more variable in, in, in size and shape. And both pathogens can also affect the fruit. This is primarily a problem uh, with shot hole, but I haven't seen any natural shot hole uh, since the mid nineties, but it can, uh, you don't have the lesion drop out if it infects fruit, but it can certainly uh, keep the fruit out of the uh, supermarket. 
And here's another shot of it. And this is the disease on apricots. I always thought that these were the best symptoms. This is the other phase. This is the twig phase. And uh, the reason the twigs are important, um, the pathogen Wilsonomyces can cause a small canker on the twigs, and that's where it survives the winter. And in the spring, if it gets moist, uh, the fungus will produce spores on the surface of those cankers, and the water uh, can splash it to developing fruit and foliage. Or if the uh, wind is, is uh, high enough, it can actually move in the wind. So it overwinters in cankers, it sporulates in early spring, and it's uh, splashed uh, to foliage and fruit generally. So you can see with over the canopy irrigation why this could aggravate, uh, aggravate this disease. So it, as I said, when we used to have a lot more uh, acreage under over the canopy irrigation uh, of cherries, it was a far more common disease. And these are the spores that are produced on the canker. Again, these are blown in the wind or splashed up to fruit and foliage uh, where they can germinate and cause a lesion. So I apologize for the three-dimensional graphs here, but um, it was the, I think it was the best way to get the point across. This particular graph is are, are the effects of uh, wetting duration here versus temperature on infection. And think of a three-dimensional graph if you see here where the bars are starting to race, think of this as your dog. Okay, and let's say you have a big bloodhound or something, and you're sitting in your living room on a cold winter night in the fires in the fireplace, and the dog's uh, in front of you, but staring into the fireplace, and its tail is is towards you, and you throw a blanket over the dog. Where the actual rise is uh, under the blanket is where all the action is. So if you look at the hours of wetting required at these different temperatures, let's look right here at, at uh, 70 degrees of Fahrenheit. You can see they just, they're just starting to bump up a little bit uh, here at uh, six hours of wetting. So there's a trace of infection at six hours of wetting. That's at the temperature optimum or optima. So here between about 60 and 70 Fahrenheit, which is the optimum range, you can see as the wetting periods get longer and we're going from zero to 24, you can see that there's a lot more infection. But right down here, there's a trace uh, after six hours of infection. Slightly different on peaches, but again, uh, we see a trace of infection uh, between about 55 and 70 Fahrenheit with as little as six hours uh, of wetting. Statistically, these are two different, uh, two different beasts. Uh, the reason we did that uh, study, by the way, was I thought that if we could figure out the wetting requirements, uh, we would be able, on cherry, we would be able to tell growers to keep your over the canopy irrigation sets uh, real short uh, and avoid infection by this disease. Well, a six hour irrigation sets really pretty short. So it didn't really turn out like we thought. But looking, uh, trying to simplify this a bit, uh, infection occur, can occur from 41 through about 81 uh, Fahrenheit. You can see at the extremes here of temperature 80 and 41, it takes longer for infection to occur uh, than it does around the temperature optimum. From 50 uh, to 75, you can get infection at about six hours of, of wetting, but the amount of lesions you'll actually see on the foliage at 65 are much higher than you would see at 50 or 75. So there's an optimum uh, type relationship uh, with temperature. So summarizing shot hole, it's promoted, uh, promoted by moisture uh, that can come in the form of uh, irrigation, and it can also be early spring showers. Uh, the last several uh, springs in, in the southern part of the state, put it this way, I remember, I remember the old days when I first came to Washington, uh, I would consider our recent springs to be dry compared to some of those that we had uh, earlier. Uh, shot hole is more of a risk in eastern Washington when water is used for frost protection, but the water uh, needs to hit the twigs, foliage, and fruit in order for that to be a problem. 
Wind currents can also disperse the spores and they require at least six hours uh, of wetting of contact uh, at the optimum temperature. When you get six hours of infection at the more extreme temperatures, it's very, very, very hit and miss. It can occur, but it's not nearly as severe as at the optimum temperature. So the pathogen may spread, spread rapidly within an individual tree uh, with movement from tree to tree much slower. Leaf infections are a constant threat to fruit infections. The reason why once the pathogen gets on the leaves and forms a lesion, it's going to produce more spores. And if those spores can get splashed up to immature fruit it can cause a problem. Temperatures of 65 to 70, I would consider the optimum range. And the lesions uh, in that range can develop within five to six days. But at the temperature extremes, it can take 15 days uh, for the lesions to appear. Now, leaf spot, this is a different uh, fungus. This is Blumeriella uh, japii. It's a fungus and it's closely related uh, to Wilsonomyces. Uh, again, it also causes a leaf spot. And as I said, from my personal uh, experience, I consider the leaf spot lesions, they tend to be uh, smaller and more, more uniform on, on the host surface. Now, the problem that uh, we have with this disease, and again, it's been reported it's, in, uh, it's been reported in Eastern Washington, but it's only been reported once to my knowledge. So I'm not saying the pathogen isn't here. I'm just saying it's, uh, it's not real common yet. Now with climate change, uh, if the climate change means over time we get more moisture, uh, when it's the cooler parts of the growing season, we might see more of both of these diseases. The problem with this disease, it can raise some quarantine and export issues. So that's why we need to be on the lookout for it. It's a major problem in the Eastern US, uh, particularly on tart cherries in Michigan. Uh, it, like shot hole, is, is very, very uh, moisture dependent. The life cycle, um, much more complicated than the shot hole. The shot hole, it overwinters in twig cankers. One spore type is produced on, on twigs. Those twigs get to leaves and fruit causing infection. Now with the leaf spot, it's a little bit different uh, of a beast. And let's start with a leaf infection here. And the life cycle here is very, very similar to the life cycle of apple scab. But if we get leaf infection, uh, eventually uh, defoliation occurs if the infection is severe enough. And as we get through the growing season, get into the fall, the sexual stage forms on those uh, excised leaves. And these develop as spring approaches. Uh, what are in, inside the sexual stage are ascospores. When we get rain early in the season, those ascospores are released, affect, infect foliage and fruit. And anyways, infect foliage and fruit. So it's a much more, more complicated life cycle. I'm trying to find my slides. Hey, again, the life cycle is very similar to scab. Uh, a film of leaf wetness or wetness is required on fruit and foliage in order for penetration to occur. The primary infection, that is what starts things in the spring, are ascospores. The secondary infection that spread the pathogen from leaves to more leaves or leaves to fruit uh, is via the second spore type or canidia. The optimum temperature is 61 to 70 and you would need shorter wetting periods in that range than you would at the extreme, such as at 46 or 81 uh, Fahrenheit. Incubation periods very similar to shot hole, five days near the optimum, 15 days uh, as we get later in the season. Uh, trying to simplify this a little bit, this is based on some data from uh, Eisensmith and Al Jones uh, from Michigan State, uh, looking at the effect of wetting uh, duration and temperature on infection. Let's look at the hours required for infection at 46, 28, 81 Fahrenheit, 28, but down here in the optimum range uh, between five uh, and seven hours. So when, as you get to the temperature optimum, it's like the peak of the dog. Uh, 
uh, that's under the blanket. As you get to the peak there, it doesn't need to be wet as long as it would it need to be at the dog's head, the dog's tail, or the dog's paws. So the highest points are where the action is. If you run into one of these leaf spots and you're unsure uh, of which one it is, and there are other things can, that can cause similar symptoms, send it to the diagnostic lab over in Pullman. Here is the contact information, and you can also do a submission form, uh, an online uh, submission form. And this uh, will would require the work of a diagnostician to get this identification right. Summary, local leaf spots. Shot hole is far less prevalent on cherries as it was a generation ago. That's because of the reduced usage of over the canopy irrigation on cherries. Cherry leaf spot has been reported here, but I have not seen it in 36 years or 36 growing seasons. This is the good news. Many of the group three, seven, and 11 fungicides used for mildew are also effective in, against leaf spot. But very carefully read the label, there are some exceptions. And I would consider them early season diseases in these parts. Last warning, uh, when you look at the labels, if you see on your mildew fungicide label that it suppresses either leaf spot or um, shot hole, if it says suppression, don't use it. Great, thank you very much. Let's give Gary a big round of applause.